In this part of the tutorial, we will talk about how to define the fmap and cmap methods for type constructors. We have seen that this is necessary in order to be able to define naturality laws um, and in order to be able to prove statements about naturality laws. So we will begin by asking the question, what is um, a, the fmap function that corresponds to a given type constructor? Um, and um, we are able to answer this question because we are talking about fully parametric code. So for instance, we are trying to find a naturality law for a function with this kind of type signature whose code is fully parametric. Now, if the code is fully parametric, then the type constructors F and G cannot be just arbitrary. They have to be following from the code of a fully parametric function, which means that there are only a few ways where, uh, of, of building such type constructors. As we have seen that the code of fully parametric functions needs to be written using only a limited number of code constructions. And so these code constructions are translated into a limited number of type constructions that um, we can use to define F and G. So let's see what these type constructions are. We could have a unit type or a fixed type where the type parameter B is not A and not some type expression that uh, depends on A. So just a different type parameter fixed, not uh, varying. So A here is the type parameter which is varying, which is um, in, um, in, in the type signature and all other type parameters are fixed when we look at this type signature. So this could be another type parameter or it could be just this type parameter A or it could be a product, a tuple of some other type expressions. Again, these type expressions must be built in the same way, or it could be an either of two type expressions. Um, the either is a um, simple uh, disjunctive type or a co-product type. Um, we can have in Scala arbitrary co-product types uh, defined using um, sealed traits and case classes and so on. Um, but they are equivalent to just using either or maybe nested either. So we're just going to take either and that's sufficient. Um, then there is a function type. So we could have a type expression and the function arrow and another type expression. Or we can have a recursive type, which is defined like this. Um, F of A is the same or equivalent to some other type expression g that uses f of a and it uses also a so this is a general way of defining a recursive type um, and finally we can have a universally quantified type so in these last two constructions we need to use a g with type two type parameters so um, which in scala we write like this um, now, um, I will just have a note that the recursive type construction could be defined in this way explicitly as a, a class that's parameterized by an arbitrary recursion scheme, G. And then um, this type F, which is just F equals fix of G A, will satisfy this type equation. So in Scala, it's very easy to define recursive, arbitrary recursive types, but this definition is only good for proving things. It's not really very convenient to use in practical programming. So in practical programming, it's more convenient to have a definition where we define F using some case classes that use F again. All right, so let's, um, Let's see uh, how we can define the fmap function. 
for this. Now we will not be able to define an f map function if f is um, uh, not covariant. So we'll see how that works. So here are the definitions of the f map function for all the cases that we have. So if it's a unit or a fixed type, then um, the f map function for an so we have an arbitrary f here. Um, f is a function of type a to b. Then um, the f map of f is just the identity function unit to unit or b to b. It does not depend on, on a. Well, it's actually, let's call this instead of b, let's call this uh, c. And then it will be, it would be less confusing. So we're, the type c should be different from a and from b also. Um, then if it's just the type parameter a, then the f map is just the function f. Um, and then we have the inductive cases that depend on other previously defined expressions. Um, if it's a pair, then we assume that we already defined f map g and f map h. And then we define f map f by destructuring the tuple. And then we use f map on each part of the tuple. And then we get um, the map tuple. Now let, let me just um, clarify here. What we need is to map the tuple g of a, h of a into g of b, h of b. And that is done by just mapping g of a into g of b, h of a into h of b, and making a new tuple. So that can be done because we assume that we already have f map g and f map h defined. So that's an inductive assumption. And um, that will be true because finally everything is defined through one of these constructions. And then we will eventually go back to the one of the base cases. Um, where we define without inductive assumptions. So this, um, this will work. Um, the next case is the either. So then we have either G of A, H of A. We need to map this into either J of B, H of B. And we define this by cases. So left goes into left, right goes into right. And we just um, use F map G and F map H each time. Um, then this case of function, it's a little more complicated because actually the G um, needs a C map, a contra map, contra variant map. So C map needs to have this type signature where you, you take A to B, but you get G of B to G of A. And only then we can define F map for F. So we need to have contra map for G and we have F map for H. So H must be covariant and G must be contravariant. Um, and then we define fmap just like this. So um, apply the fmap to some, uh, some function p, g of a to h of a. We expect to get a value of type g of b to h of b. Uh, we, so we expect to get a function since, since this is a function type. So we take this function. Um, and then we write this expression, which is a function of this type. Now look at this expression. First, it's a contra map on, on F. So that goes G of B to G of A. Then P goes G of A to H of A. And then F map H that goes here. So that's, that's how we get the correct types. Um, for the recursive type, we actually need to have F maps separately for the two type of parameters of G. So we have these by inductive assumption, uh, which means that actually we are defining F map um, for a type constructor that possibly could have other type parameters. We're just defining F map here in this definition 
um, with respect to one of the type parameters of f. So we, we, we write f as if it has only one type parameter, but actually it could have many other type parameters that are all fixed. So for example, it could have the type parameter c that is, all, that is fixed. We don't write it in here to just to simplify, but actually we, we do define, we, we need to define it because our inductive assumption is that we're able to define f map separately with respect to each of the um, type parameters. So if we have them, then we define it like this. So um, we map uh, uh, f of a to f of b here by induction. So this is a recursive uh, invocation of the same f map f that we are defining. Um, that is allowed because we can define the function recursively. Um, then we do f map g1, so the first type parameter of g is being used here in f map, and that maps this into g of f of b, comma a, and then we just need to map the second type parameter of g. So we have a composition of these two like this. And the types are correct. And finally, for the um, universally quantified type, we need to just have f map with respect to the first uh, type parameter. And then we write like this. So we just, just need to lift the first uh, type parameter. Um, now, when f is contravariant, so this should be changed uh, notation here. Let's call this f, so it's going to be f. Um, so if f is contravariant, then we use the cmap function. We we have we cannot define f map. Now, how do we know if it's covariant? We'll see that in a moment. Um, but Actually, this follows from these constructions. So if it is, for example, f of a equals a, then we can define f map, which means that this is covariant. This is covariant because we can define f map. This is covariant if both of them are covariant. This is covariant, this is, and this is covariant. So we see uh, our construction forces us to count the arrows and each time behind the arrow, we have a contravariant and every other construction uh, doesn't change the variance. And so we'll, we'll see how that works in a moment. Um, so here we actually go through cases, except for the second case, the second case cannot work for contravariant because f of a equals a is not contravariant, it's, it's covariant. So this case we don't need. Um, in, in this uh, CMAP construction. So we, we go through the same, very similar constructions, um, except that we use CMAP instead of FMAP and FMAP instead of CMAP. So very similar constructions, uh, except for flipping contravariant and covariant. Um, now, you see, because there are the same constructions, except for the function type, the function type swaps covariant and contravariant positions of type parameters. So when we have this construction, then if, if this is contravariant and this is covariant, then the entire thing is contravariant. And here, if this is covariant and this is contravariant, then the entire thing is covariant. And that's how it must be. If you have covariant and covariant, then nothing works. It, it does not become covariant or contravariant. So, which means that when you have, um, so here's this. Um, suppose you have an arbitrary fully parametric type expression, then each of the type parameters is in the covariant position or in the contravariant position. So we can talk about that. Why, why do we even talk about the position? Because um, 
we have a type that must be built up from uh, pairs and either and type parameters and function arrows and recursion and, uh, and, and nothing else. And so we know that if a type is behind the function arrow, then um, it must be contravariant. And if the type is in front of a function arrow, then it is covariant. In other words, this expression, we can just put, uh, read, read that right to left and see here is to the right of function arrow. So this is all covariant, we'll write a plus. And this is behind the function arrow. So this entire thing is contravariant, which means that this is contravariant and this is covariant, so flipped again. So this entire thing is to the right of the function arrow is in a covariant position. And this is in a contravariant position. So this is again contravariant, even though it's behind two arrows, but they're not nested. So the arrows that nested flip covariance, arrows that are not nested, they do not. So, so this is contravariant. This entire thing is contravariant. Inside this type, there's a covariant position which becomes contravariant because this entire position is contravariant. So that's how it works. And here's a positive position or covariant position. And this is a negative or contravariant position. So in this way, we can quickly put labels of uh, covariant or contravariant on each position of a type parameter. And then we look, are all positions the same for, for a certain type parameter? For example, here, B is always as a positive position, so it's covariant. But A is not always as a positive position, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. So F of AB is covariant with respect to B. In other words, we can define F map for it with respect to B. Um, we can use the constructions to define F map, but we cannot define F map with respect to A. And we also cannot define C map with respect to A. We'll see what we can define, but for now, let's just note that uh, we just look at the positions of type parameters. We can recognize covariance and contravariance just by counting how many nested function arrows we have in front of a type parameter. So defined in this way, I would like to note um, the contravariance and covariance is, is independent of subtitle. We did not mention subtitle here. Um, often covariance and contravariance is defined using subtitle. This is confusing. In my view, this is a mistake. Um, you, covariance and contravariance is completely different and separate from subtyping. It's covariance and contravariance is a property of type parameters in a type. Uh, you can you, you can define F map if a type constructor is covariant. You can define C map when it is contravariant. And uh, that's it. That's the definition of covariant and contravariant. Can you define an F map or a C map that satisfy the laws? And um, uh, we can uh, use those constructions to generate the code of F map and C map quite mechanically, just looking at this type expression, we note that B only occurs in positive positions, which means it's covariant in, in B. And then we can use those constructions to write down the code for F map with respect to B. Um, so F map with respect to B would be a function of type, uh, let's say B to C, F of A, B, F of A, C. So you can write a function of this type, let's call it F map B. And um, it will satisfy the laws of F map. Um, so a type expression can be analyzed and you can find it to be covariant, contravariant, or neither neither covariant nor contravariant with respect to a specific type parameter. Now that situation is uh, usually called invariant. So it's invariant with respect to A. Now this is, I find it's very confusing, a bad choice of name because uh, uh, the concept of invariance is used in mathematics uh, 
to, to mean that something does not change. You, you change one thing, but another thing does not change. So um, another thing is invariant with respect to the change of the first thing. That is not what happens here. Uh, you can change pi parameters. Um, so this is confusing, but anyway, that is the accepted name. Um, and uh, once you have re re recognized that, say, you have a type constructor A, F of A, type constructor G of A, and they're both covariant, then you can generate the code of F map for each of them. And then you can write the naturality law for function of that type signature using F map for F and F map for G. That is the code that you need to write in the naturality law, not some other possibly code for F map and C map, but only this code that is generated using these constructions. Um, so uh, what about invariant type constructors? Now, invariant type constructors are not actually invariant in the sense that is usually attributed to that word. And that's why I say it's a bad name because you can actually change them. You can define a different method called XMAP that uh, changes that, that type parameter. So here's how it works. Um, uh, one uses a trick. Um, let's say you have this type constructor where uh, this type parameter A here is a, in a, a covariant position, here in a contravariant position, contravariant position, covariant position. So the type constructor F is neither covariant nor contravariant with respect to A. But you have the notion of position. So each position is either covariant or contravariant. You can have a trick that renames all the contravariant position, uh, positions to a different type parameter. So then you introduce, let's say, type parameter X, which uh, will be for contravariant positions. So these are these positions and these positions. So now you have a different type constructor with two type parameters where the type parameter X is only in contravariant positions and type parameter A is only in covariant positions. And uh, your initial type constructor F is expressed like this, uh, where you put the same type parameter in P. But, but you now have this type parameter with X and different type parameter A, and you have the freedom to set it not to the same type if you feel like. And such uh, type constructors with two type parameters, contravariant in the first one, and covariant in the second one, are called profunctors. Um, just a name. Um, it's um, just a name that we want to put on them. And they are important. So they are used, because they're important because. Um, an arbitrary type constructor F will always have some type parameters in negative position and others in a positive position. Um, and any arbit um, arbitrary fully parametric type constructor will be expressed as some profunctor with uh, the type parameters set to the same type. That is an important way of expressing them because um, these profunctors um, are just ordinary covariant or contravariant with respect to each of their type parameters. So now, because of that, we can implement C map with respect to X and F map with respect to A. So we can implement these methods. And um, finally, we can compose them and get a method called X map, which um, changes P of A A into P of B B. And so this is how it works. It takes two functions, one function a to b and another function b to a. And then first you can map p a a into p b a because you have a function b to a, so you know, which is g. Um, so you use c map b. And then you are here, so you get a value of type p of b a, and then you use uh, F map with respect to the second type parameter with the function F of type A to B. So you get here. So in this way, 
you can map PAA to PBB given two functions, A to B and B to A. So that's um, um, now P of AA is just F of A. So you have mapped F of A to F of B, but you need two functions. Um, now there is a detail here because you could compose these uh, functions in another order. You can first use F map with respect to the second type parameter and then use C map with respect to the first type parameter. Um, now, is the result going to be different? It is not going to be different. We need to prove that, but we will in uh, later parts of this tutorial. Um, and what we will prove is that there is a commutativity law. So the X map function is defined either like this or like this, the results are always the same. Now, um, what we still need to do is we need to prove that these functions f map and c map are uh, satisfying the laws of, of the function. There are two laws, which is the first one is the identity law, which says that f map of identity equals identity, c map of identity equals identity. Now the, the types of course are different here. This is identity A to A, and this is identity F of A to F of A. But um, that's the law. And the second law is a composition. So if you have a function A to B and a function B to C, then the composition of functions um, is lifted into a function composition. So if you first compose, and then you lift to a function which will have type f of a to f of c. You can do the same if you first just map f of a to f of b, and then you map, map f of b to f of c. And the similar, similar thing with contra map, except there's an opposite order of functions here, because functions need to, um, match the types and then um, a C map goes backwards. Uh, it goes F of B to F of A here. So you have to change the order. So now uh, we will go through each case in the constructions and prove that the laws go. 